Hello and welcome to the On Record portion of the Rockbridge Report. I'm Alex Cummings and joining me today is Lori Keckler, the Executive Director of the Community Foundation of Bath, Allegheny, and Rockbridge Counties. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Alex, for having me. Could you tell me a little bit about your background in nonprofit um, management and organization? Um, I started about 17 years ago working in nonprofits. I was, started, I was the executive director for the local chamber of commerce where I worked. So I was able to get involved in a lot of community functions that were going on there. From that, I started serving on various boards, sports organizations, things that involved the youth and uh, moving forward. My degree was in human resources, so I spent most of my life working in that field. But after moving to the Rockbridge County area five years ago, I started getting involved in the nonprofits again, and most recently took a position as the executive director for the Community Foundation of Rockwood, Beth and Allegheny. So, based on your experience working with nonprofit organizations in other areas, can you tell me a little bit about the needs that you see here in Rockbridge County? Well, with my job at the Community Foundation, obviously I work with all of the nonprofits in the area. Our goal is to help those nonprofits achieve their goals financially. So the donors that I work with, um, we work together to put money into the pockets of those, those needs that are in the community. For example, the free clinic, you know, with the unemployment rates with the way they are, more and more people are either uninsured or underinsured and needing services, mental, medical, dental, and vision from the free clinic. We try to support the free clinic in those initiatives. Um, different areas like that. Rockbridge Area Transportation System, for example, is another nonprofit. Serves in the community, bringing people around. Um, we try to support them. So when, my, when a donor comes to me to endow funds, they do what we call donor advised funds. And on an annual basis, the donor tells us where they want the money to go. And we only support another 501c3 organization. That's where we put our money in the community. So can you tell me about your involvement in other um, community services? Well, I've always been, you know, I'm a parent of five, so I've always been involved with my children. So one of the things I try to be involved with is the schools. So I serve on the superintendent's advisory committee so that I'm part of the budgeting process. I also serve on the parent advisory committee to be a part of the activities that go on in school. But one of the things that I discovered when I moved to Virginia was that there wasn't enough after school activities for the youth. Being a cheerleading coach for a number of years before moving here, I decided to bring a competition cheer program to the area. And so I have 60 youth that are involved in three teams of competition cheerleading that I brought to Rockbridge County three years ago. And how has that been? It's been great. I mean, before the kids, you know, didn't have, I mean, they had school activities, but they didn't really have anything outside of school. Competition, competition children brings a whole new level of confidence to children. I mean, it's not something that's easy. You know, we stunt, we tumble, and it's something that you really take a lot of pride in. So my girls are not expected, you know, to get good grades and be examples, role models in the community, but also it's you know, building their confidence. It's making them different people. How did you see the need for an after-school program like this? How did you um, how did you figure out that a program like this could well, be just my used? experience? I had worked in an all-star gym for a number of years in Ohio, and I saw the confidence. I saw what it did for the girls. The problem was that the all-star gyms are very expensive, and most people in this area don't have two or three hundred dollars a month to spend to take their children to something like this. So I was able to provide this program for free by working with the um, Parks and Recreation Department, the schools to allow me the gyms for practice space, and um, bring the program together so that more and more girls could participate in it even if they couldn't afford it. So how often do you practice? Well, I have three teams, so we practice you know, different days. So on an average, it's six days a week for me between one team or the other, and then we've got a competition, obviously a whole weekend gone of competing and doing that, which we do six competitions a year. Are there other programs like this that you compete against? Um, not that it's free. There's, there's you know, also gyms in Roanoke and Stanton and other areas, but there, there's nothing that's available you know, where they don't have to pay. And mm -hmm. can you tell me more specifically how this program is funded? Um, it's basically funded, you know, I, I volunteer my coaching time. The schools provide the gyms for um, practices for us. The 
parents do have to pay the competition fees because each girl has to enter you know, the competition, but we do fundraisers, we do car washes, we sell candles at Christmas time, we do Applebee's pancake fundraisers, we do enough fundraisers to offset it all so the girls don't have to put anything out of pocket. About how much does it cost to keep this program running? Well, the other thing they have to pay is their competition fees, and it averages about $50 a competition. So doing six competitions a year, it's about $300 per girl, and they can fundraise that between all the fundraisers we do it throughout the year if they do well. And what are some of the changes you've noticed for the girls who participate in your program? Well, I mean, obviously it, it impacts their school programs, so it not only helps them confidently on their own, but it also improves the school programs. So when you go to the high school games, you see the cheerleaders, in basketball, football, who now have improved skills, better stunning, better confidence, better jumps, all those things that come with it. What about as far as family relationships? Well, you know, I do have um, a lot of contact with the parents, so if there's problems at home, the parents always seem to come and let me know that, and it gives me an opportunity to talk to the girls one-on-one, -on -one. and sometimes you know, talking to someone else has a different impact than talking to your parents. So I believe that, you know, me being able to be there as a role model and a mentor to them um, does help make a difference when their problems at home because a lot of times when you have a problem, the parent will just automatically say, you're off the team, you're done. And I always encourage the parents to give me the opportunity to speak with them and let them make the changes needed before they make that decision. Have parents been, how have parents responded to this program? I'm sure they're they're grateful, but as far mm -hmm. as transporting the girls, I mean, do, are there challenges? Well, I mean, there's challenges, but they do try to carpool, you know, those sort of things. Um, the parents have responded very positively. I have a great group of parents. Um, they, they're very proud, something that's never been in this area before. Um, so there's a lot of bragging rights going on. You know, that's my girl. I mean, they're very good. They work hard, and they're a very good team. Most recently, the parents have stepped up and asked to have a parent team. So I've started coaching a parent team. So I actually have a team of parents who are now practicing and learning and want to compete at the next competition. So it's, it's fun and it's going to be great because the girls will be very excited to go see their parents go out there on stage and compete. So, um, what are some of your goals moving forward? With the program? Mm -hmm. um, just continue to grow and build. Um, the first year we had two teams, we've moved up to three teams. Continue to you know encourage the youth to be involved, get good grades, be good role models in the community, and you know we've moved. You know the chair program is in is in levels. You go from level one to five. We moved from level one to level three already. So we're halfway through the levels that are available. And as we continue to improve, then we'll be able to move up to different levels. Okay, and um, switching gears a little bit, could we talk about your involvement with the new community table, which just opened mm -hmm. recently? Absolutely. Um, I'm the vice president of the board for the community table. We have just served our third meal last night. The first week we um, served 76 people, the second week we served 128. I haven't got the head count for last night, but I believe our number increased again. People are coming in, they're leaving with smiles on their face, their belly full. And it's been, it's been great. We're serving a healthy, nutritious meal every Monday night. And for a lot of these people, they're telling us that that's the only nutritious meal that they get all week. And so our goal is to continue to expand that and hopefully be able to offer more days in the future. Um, I'm spending my Monday nights in the kitchen, helping with the cooking, really enjoying it. Um, and I think, I think it's great. Everything has been off to a really nice start. And what are some of the challenges that you've had so far with, with such a large startup organization? Well, the main, th the main challenge in the beginning was finding a location, you know, where we were going to house this. And when the city of Buena Vista, or, I'm sorry, the city of Buena Vista didn't, want, um, didn't have space for us over there, we were able to get the city of Lexington to offer us the um, rescue building, because originally it was supposed to be in Buena Vista. We um, moved into there cooperation with the Rara organization, the food bank in Blue Ridge, and it's really came together nicely. Our, ideally, we wanted to have our own building restaurant style thing, but we've come to realize that it's really not about the you know location, but more about serving the need. And so um, the challenge of finding the building kind of went away for us because now that we're feeding people, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. How long do you have the building for? We, um, we're running on a month-to-month -month basis right now, okay. 
Um, we basically were building just Monday nights, was hoping to move to Wednesdays and Fridays soon. Um, that's our goal, eventually five days a week, but it's going to take, you know, getting a lot of volunteers in place and a lot of planning for that to happen. Ideally, what we would like to see is an organization owning a night. So maybe two nights a year, a particular organization would come in and they would take care of the cooking, the prepping, the waiting, the cleaning up. And so, you know, where the board isn't constantly having to be the one handling everything. But that's going to take a process of us building a reputation, talking to these organizations, and then scheduling that moving forward. Have you reached out to any organizations yet about this? Um, we've been out talking to organizations. We've reached out a lot to a lot of the churches. I know that our volunteer coordinator, Nancy Tippins, has wanted to talk to a couple of different women's clubs. Um, the Rotary has already started to be involved. The Community Bank over in Buena has been sending their staff over on Monday nights to wait. So, you know, organizations are starting to catch on and get involved. And what is the feedback you've heard from people in the community and other nonprofit organizations? From the other nonprofits? Um, I haven't had a lot of feedback from the other nonprofits, but from the community as a whole, I mean, people are happy we're there. We're happy that, you know, people are being fed. We do work with, you know, Rara, and they're very pleased to have us there because it's kind of really convenient for them because people come and pick up their food boxes from the food pantry. And then immediately after that, they can go over and sit down and have a meal before they go. So in one trip, they're able to not only get the supplies for the month that they need, but then have a meal before, you know, and so that's nice. Is there any kind of eligibility guideline for who can come to the we don't ask table? For, we don't ask for income eligibility. We don't ask anybody to prove anything. Anybody can come in and eat. If you have money to pay and you want to make a donation, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Um, it's, but anybody who wants to come and have a meal can have one. And where are you, um, where do you see the community table going in the future? The community table in the future? I have, I'm hoping to see it as, you know, serving five meals a week, you know, people coming in there every night, having, you know, like I said, a service organization owning a night and everything moving forward that way. People having a place to go, and go every night and have a healthy, nutritious meal. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for joining us for the Rockbridge Report. I'm Alex Cummings.